Welcome to the Economic and Political History Podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas on the intersection of economics, political science, and history. Hello, dear listeners. I'm Javier Mejia, your host, and I'm thrilled to share with you an episode from a new show called The Civic Agora. This show is part of the Sanford Civics Initiative, and there we explore the essence of citizenship and unravel the threads of thought that construct a flourishing society. This episode will focus on the captivating history of political ideas in China. Whether you have a passion for the intricacies of political philosophy or you're simply curious about the evolution of societies, this episode is tailor-made for you. If you find our exploration as enthralling as we do, be sure to subscribe to the Civic Agora wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Civic Agora. I'm your host, Javier Mejia. And today I have the great pleasure of being with Dongsheng Yang. Dongsheng is Assistant Professor of Chinese Studies at Fordham University in New York City. And he was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford, at the Stanford Civics Initiative for a couple of years. He's an expert on Chinese political thought and intellectual history. And that's what we're going to be talking with him today. Dong Sheng, how are you? I'm good. Really nice to see you here. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm very, very glad of seeing you again. It's been a while. That's uh, right. And, I was here. Yeah. And well, we haven't had the opportunity to see each other in person. Uh, ever since. So I'm glad to see, I'm glad to see that you're doing well. Um, and I would like to start this conversation by asking you a bit about your origins mm -hmm. and your life and your path as a scholar. Um, so I know you went to Princeton for, uh, for your PhD. I know you come from China, but yeah. I don't know much more than that actually about, uh, your your life tell us a bit about that um and tell us a bit and like when you tell us about your life uh give us a sense of when your curiosity for the history of ideas and uh the study of uh, political thought came to came came to you what's what's a bit that story that's right so um I actually started to be interested in uh, philosophy, political theory, or humanities in general uh, since, since I was in high school. And um, I still remember that um, that time I got a book on Thomas Hobbes. So, um, um, so from my perspective nowadays, it's actually not a very good book because it's actually written not by a very famous scholar and it's just for introduction only. But that book was fascinating because that was the first time I encountered kind of the, the modern Western way of doing political theory. It's kind of to use the scientific method to construct kind of a normatively attractive political order. So that's the charm, the first time I experienced the charm of political philosophy. So um, later, um, after kind of passing the college entrance exam, I was admitted by Beijing University, and um, so I chose international relations. I wanted to choose philosophy, but um, so this is a very strange thing in China that that year, um, the philosophy department didn't recruit undergrad students in my city. So uh, I went to uh, International School of International Studies. I studied kind of theories of international relations, but just um, after one year, I found that that was not the theory I wanted to study. So um, I chose philosophy as my second major and um, um, chose kind of a maybe uh, more than 20 or 30 courses uh, in the philosophy department and surveyed the entire Western history of philosophy as well as Chinese history of philosophy. So um, uh, as, um, as, uh, as a junior student uh, at Beijing University, I decided that I want to go to America because that time uh, it was still a very kind of open and uh, relatively free time in China. 
um, people at Beijing University all talk about studying abroad either to kind of maybe boost uh, our CV or is just to learn something that we can never learn in China. So um, I was, that time I was very ambitious. I thought that maybe a PhD program could admit me directly, a PhD program in political theory. Uh, but actually kind of um, later, right now, I know that it's all because of the lack of connections and also because being in China and uh, more than 10 years ago, there wasn't very um, um, good connections between us and foreign, especially American scholars. So it's very hard for you to get good recommendation letters. But luckily, I was admitted by Duke University. So I spent two years there as, um, as a master's student. Um, and then I applied again and got uh, the offer from Princeton University. So I stayed there for six years. Um, finish my coursework and dissertation. So uh, basically, that's my origin. Um, I I think um, the one thing I feel lucky about myself is that um, uh, I have never lost passion to do political theory, even though in the past more than 10 years, I encountered a lot of self-doubts and also kind of maybe um, disagreements with a lot of mainstream American approach of doing normative political theory. But um, still, um, it's, it's my job, it's my passion, and uh, I'm very happy that I got a job uh, at Fordham, even though that's not a political science or political theory job, but my department is good enough to let me focus on what I want to do rather than what they want me to do. So that's a Chinese studies title, but um, I'm still I still consider myself first as a political theorist and sec only secondarily as a scholar of China. Let, let me ask you more about that, about um, about how we train political theories and in, in the U.S. and how different that is from what. Uh, people do in other parts of the world. How was your personal experience? We're going to be talking more about this from your like research perspective, but um, but how was your personal experience from thinking about Can and, and, and taking this other classes on uh, in China mm -hmm. about Western philosophy and then coming to the US and starting to learn in the West about the same authors, was it any different? Uh, what, what, what was that experience? Yeah, I would say um, it's very, very different. Um, I actually brought this to discussion when I was teaching a graduate um, seminar on comparative political theory at Stanford, um, when we were talking about pedagogy. So uh, in China, our curricula, especially in philosophy, because um, not a lot of universities have an independent political science department due to historical reasons. We at Beijing University actually uh, didn't have a political science department. So um, you have to go to kind of international studies or um, the kind of public administration school to look for political science classes, political theory classes, especially. And the philosophy department has a very strong uh, lineup of um, political theory, political philosophy classes. But one thing that um, uh, makes China, or maybe a lot of uh, all, almost all other Asian universities um, different from American universities, is that we emphasize our own tradition as well as the Western tradition equally. So, um, for example, we have to um, take at least the two courses in the history of Western philosophy and equally two courses in the history of Chinese philosophy. And for us to get a degree, a second degree in philosophy, you have to devote equal amount of time to Chinese philosophy and Western philosophy. And in addition to that, also to um, um, ethics, to aesthetics, um, and history of science. Uh, but again, so these courses will be divided almost evenly to Western, the Western part and, uh, and Chinese part. Um, so, uh, but after coming to the United States, I find that, um, yes, very understandably, um, 
they just focus on the Western tradition. And um, but the good thing is that in the past 10 years, we have seen an increasing number of courses offered on, for example, anti-colonial political thought, post-colonial political thought and non-Western political thought. But still, it's not as in China that we treat the Chinese tradition and the Western tradition almost evenly. Um, but one thing I would say that um, um, America teaches me more is that it's a more diverse country. And um, in China, actually, uh, at least when I was a student, we didn't emphasize other non-Western traditions. So um, uh, unless you are really, really dedicated to, for example, Indian philosophy or Islamic philosophy, otherwise there is no requirement for you to understand those other traditions. Whereas in America, I feel that uh, I'm more incentivized to learn those um, other traditions that I was not very familiar with. So um, to prepare my courses and in my course of graduate studies, I was able to uh, read Gandhi, to read Tagore, to read some other Islamic thinkers, and occasionally also Latin American political thinkers from my conference, from my interactions with other scholars. So um, I would say that that's the major difference. So in China, it's more like kind of um, 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 eco distribution between Western and Chinese civilizations or traditions, whereas in America, you still see the mainstream of doing contemporary American normative political theory, whereas on the other hand, you see a very diverse range of intellectual, uh, intellectual pursuit. Let me ask you more about the, I guess, the evolution of the interest in the attention for, mm -hmm. for this non-classical Western traditions, right? So you were mm -hmm. describing how that seems to be increasing in recent years. And and I would like to know in particular about uh, Chinese political thought, how that has evolved over time. Because you, based on what you've told me, uh, I get the impression that there was a wave of scholars from China that were coming to the U.S. that probably fed some of this interest. Uh, but you seem also to suggest that those things have changed recently, right? So um, is that actually the case? What has happened? How do you think that the field is going to evolve in the coming years, considering the probably limitations of, uh, of the exposure of, um, of scholars from China in the U.S.? Uh, how, how do you think about this? That's right. So, um... So I would say uh, uh, if we just focus on the field that I'm working on, uh, Chinese political thought, not just not Chinese politics, because you know that a lot of um, there is um, there is an entire army working on Chinese politics um, as an empirical field in comparative politics. Whereas if you uh, mention, for example, normative theories about China or the history of Chinese political thought, this is still a very marginal and minor field. And uh, in terms of its history in America, so um, the origin of Chinese political thought as an academic field in America actually was in the Cold War. So during the Cold War period, especially immediately after the Communist Party um, uh, kind of um, uh, gained power, um, so America, the American government was very curious about why kind of they lost mainland China to the communists. So they established a lot of academic programs and especially Harvard, Harvard at time, the 1950s uh, to the 1970s was actually a hub of producing China scholars. And those China scholars, because that time was before the rise of behavioral science, so those scholars, they were well-trained in political theory, they were well-trained in philosophy, and also in Chinese history. So what their uh, style of doing research uh, was very old-fashioned. Um, so uh, I would say that the 1950s to 1970s was a golden age for the study of Chinese political thought, especially uh, political thought in the classical period, 
and also in early modern period, I mean, late 19th and early 20th century, because they wanted to understand why communism became so attractive to Chinese intellectuals and later revolutionized the entire country. Um, but I think it's because of uh, the decline <coughs> of intellectual history um, in the field of history um, and also because that time uh, there wasn't enough diversity in the field of political theory or political science. So uh, after the 1970s, there was actually a huge decline of Chinese political thought or Chinese intellectual history in America. I, I speak uh, of the academia as a whole rather than just the several specific fields. So uh, what's new about the study of Chinese political thought nowadays is that scholars want to bring Chinese ideas into conversation with mainstream Western ideas. So they want to revive the study of Chinese political thought in the field of philosophy or in the field of political theory. So that is not just an area study, is not just for policymakers to understand China's history or historical trajectory or possible future development, is more for mainstream Western scholars to take China and Chinese ideas more seriously and to expose some blind spots of Western political theories so that maybe the Western audiences would learn something helpful from non-Western traditions. And that is the guiding principle of what we call comparative political theory. So right now it's not kind of just the Chinese political theory is on the rise. Uh, the study of Indian political theory, Islamic political theory, they are also very important. And um, I would say that um, uh, they actually, um, uh, they have done better than scholars uh, on Chinese political thought um, due to kind of maybe uh, more um, intense historical interactions between these traditions um, uh, on the one hand and also the West on the other. I want to ask you more later about this broader comparative dimension. I know mm -hmm. you've taught on this um, and you've done research on, on it, but before that, I would like to um, dig a bit deeper into China and its ideas. And maybe a good way of starting that conversation is um, mm -hmm. the, one of the courses you used to teach here at the, at the Stanford Civics Initiative that it's a course on Chinese, Chinese political thought. And I was checking the syllabus um, to prepare for our conversation. There was something that I was kind of curious ab about, which is that it begins, so the course is called Chinese political thought, 1895, 2021. Mm -hmm. I can understand why it ended up in 2021, but why did it start in 1895? What's the, what's the important event there? That's right. That's right. So um, I actually, when I was an undergraduate student at Peking University or Beijing University, I was particularly interested in the reception of Western political ideas in modern China, because I find that um, um, so if you want to be a scholar of Chinese philosophy, you have to be basically a classicist. So uh, you have to kind of um, be very, very um, fluent in classical Chinese and also um, in all those very difficult but um, very excellent scholarship on Chinese philosophy. So, but I was more interested in the modern period of Chinese political thought and why that started with um, 1895 rather than earlier or later. Because, so according to um, some narratives, and I would say a quite conventional narrative. So the, the first Sino-Japanese War um, in 1894, that was actually the most shocking moment for Chinese intellectuals in the 19th century. Because so the first Opium War in the 1940s, that was a starting point uh, for um, Sino-Western um, interactions in the modern period. Um, but actually the shock was not that intense. So only when Japan, as an Eastern, as a former student of China, defeated China 
as the center of the kind of entire East Asian world order, that the Chinese thinkers started to feel that something actually went wrong. So uh, we actually, we have to uh, catch up with Japan. We have to learn why they are able to make themselves stronger. And if they learn the West, if they imitate the West, we should do the same. So that's the real awakening moment for Chinese thinkers to borrow Western ideas. And you do see that most interesting political theories uh, on Chinese uh, political reform or on constitutional monarchy, on democracy, on freedom, equality. So they actually came from that period uh, after 1895 and kind of maybe up to uh, up to the founding of the People's Republic, because that was a time of relative freedom. So um, even though a lot of scholars uh, in the in the last decade of the Qing Dynasty had to express those ideas in Japan because they were actually banned um, in China after some failed reform um, attempts. But actually that time uh, censorship was not very strong. You can smuggle those newspapers and magazines from Japan to China. So uh, even though those um, magazines were printed and edited in, in Japan, you get a very, very sizable audience in, in mainland China. The debate was actually uh, very vibrant and you do see a lot of things, kind of how they negotiate the relationship between the Confucian tradition and modern Western ideas and how you invent a new elite to lead the country and most importantly, how you invent a new modern citizenry, not as sub passive subjects under a despotism, but active citizens um, in a modern constitutional democracy. So that transitional period is very fascinating. You don't see a lot of discussions of the same kind in contemporary Western political theory because you know that in America, even though in recent years, people kind of people are worried about political order, basic constitutional order, but for the past, maybe kind of um, at least the since the end of the Second World War, political order, democratic order was well guaranteed. So what people think more abstractively about political thought, but, um, um, but kind of few scholars would think those um, issues that non-Western societies would encounter, how to negotiate with their traditions, how to ensure a peaceful and orderly transition, and how to make kind of a, how to initiate a revolution. And on the other hand, kind of how to make sure that revolution would not be war the entire society and make kind of make an, bring an anarchy instead of a functioning uh, constitutional democracy. So these are the kind of funding problems. Americans may tend to think that they have solved that problem um, in the 18th century or maybe the second time during the Civil War. But um, uh, you would find that even in 2023, even right now, we are still solving the problem of political funding. So the same problem emerge, emerges again and again uh, in China. Um, and makes China kind of uh, different from other established Western liberal democracies. The, this, it's super interesting. I have many questions based on what you told me. But I, first, I'm, I'm curious about the logistics of the of the this sort of like rediscovery of the West in China. So this mm -hmm. happens through Japan then for a good part, right? So you seem to describe that. It's not exactly that the Chinese market is demanding this uh, European books or newspapers mm -hmm. through Japan that uh, in the very beginning, that's how they're accessing this information, right? Exactly. That's right. So Japan actually played a fun fundamental role of disseminating Western ideas to the entire East Asia. Um, so China actually had some very good translators and um, uh, People, people believe that a person called Yan Fu is the founding father of modern Chinese political thought. Uh, but actually, kind of, um, he, he translated a lot of books, in, including kind of um, uh, Meals on Liberty and uh, Adam Smith's uh, The Wealth of Nations. Uh, but kind of for more uh, political science or political theoretical discussions of um, the Western world, uh, its entire history and its contemporary, I mean, contemporary in that time, uh, the uh, um, uh, turn of the century, 
um, early 20th century. So that actually came from Japan because Japanese scholars uh, were maybe two or three decades ahead of Chinese scholars of studying Western uh, Western ideas and Western practices. So uh, and then and also that time kind of translating uh, Japanese um, to Chinese was relatively more straightforward than translating, for example, German or English into Chinese directly because of the um, kind of um, uh, similarity of Chinese characters. And also Japanese scholars, they actually did a lot of work of inventing some new terms to translate those Western, difficult Western ideas that you cannot find in classical Chinese. So they actually did a very good job in this and they saved a lot of time uh, and effort for Chinese scholars. And okay, I want to again ask you many things about this. And my, I guess my broad question here would be, <clears throat> what were the following is the following steps after that, right? But mm -hmm. but for that, I want to ask you first: what were the things that at the very beginning were more attractive for the Chinese audience? So you were talking about Adam Smith and Mill, so it seems like classical liberalism was that but i mean this is like these are ideas that were developed a century before the events we're describing right so mm -hmm. i don't know what was the, the those first ideas that uh became popular among chinese intellectuals from that were coming from the west and then what happened tell me about well like how do we end up with having a the proliferation of uh, of communist ideas tell me about that that's right. So um, a conventional narrative um, in the 19, in the early 1980s um, is that actually kind of um, the first generation of Chinese, modern Chinese political thinkers, they were attracted to modern liberalism, not because of kind of uh, abstract concepts such as personal freedom, individual, uh, individualism, individual rights or equality. It was because of nationalism. So um, um, there is a very famous um, secondary um, secondary book on Yan Fu's political thought by Benjamin Schwartz. Um, so he's actually a very key figure of the Harvard circle for studying Chinese thought from the 1950s to the 1980s. So his argument, very, very famous argument was that, so Yan Fu was attracted to liberalism because he believed that it was liberalism that made the United Kingdom great, the Great Britain great in the world. Because if mm -hmm. you give people the right to participate in politics, and if you arrange political institutions so that elites and um, kind of ordinary people can compete with each other, can struggle and kind of maintain that struggle within an institutional framework, then actually you create a very energetic society. And this energetic society, when they cannot contain their energy within their single country, they colonize the entire world. <laughs> so it's actually an overflowing of, of energy and it's kind of like a very uh, power-based and a social Darwinist. And that time actually social Darwinism was, Herbert Spencer was super popular in China. And, um, so uh, that was why liberalism and uh, its associated concepts such as freedom and democracy had to be introduced to China because they believe that, yes, you invent a vibrant citizenry so that China can be more competitive in international fires. And uh, there is one uh, thinker called Liang Qichao, who is super um, influential in China, he even thought that after we become stronger, let's colonize uh, some other places, for example, Southeast Asia. Uh, it's, it's actually fine to colonize them. And uh, you know what? Uh, a lot of Southern Chinese immigrants, they thrive in other societies, um, in Indonesia, in Malaysia. So why don't we just kind of maybe expand our uh, living spaces? He, used, he actually used the term living spaces. Um, so uh, to kind of uh, make China more competitive. And uh, so that was their idea. But after practicing those ideas for maybe 10 years after the Republican Revolution in uh, 1911, uh, people were super disappointed because that was a total chaos. 
there was two restorations of monarchy, there were civil wars, there were endless quarrels between political elites, and uh, constitutional democracy basically was nothing. And that was an anarchy and also kind of uh, separatist forces in each province, they would drive China apart. So uh, that's why kind of Chinese thinkers started to think that maybe liberal democracy was not a very good method for making China stronger. Let's find some other ideas. So communism as a wholesale alternative to the liberal solution would be a better option. So that's why intellectuals turned radical in the 1920s and started to kind of maybe uh, use Leninist ideas to transform China. So um, the Communist Party was not the only party to become Leninist. Actually, the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang Party, also aspired to become Leninist. So their only difference with the Communist Party was that they were not able to resolve internal uh, factional conflicts. And the Communist Party, by using the democratic centralism, they were able to unify the entire country and um, defeated the Kuomintang Party, the Nationalist Party, and founded the Communist China. So uh, that was the conventional narrative, which I think is basically right, even though I'm trying to modify that. But if you see the entire picture, this is the narrative that most kind of um, that that is most received by at least the Chinese Chinese thinkers. The Communist Party also was at the same. Um, in our kind of um, history books, uh, we were taught that um, uh, the Communist Party was chosen uh, not by the heaven. That was the old, the old Confucian justification, but by history. It's after our trials and errors that um, people find that only communist, only communism can save China and only communism can build a new nation and new life. So uh, that's the narrative. That's it's super interesting. I mean, I've heard some of these stories vaguely over my career, but I think I've never had like such a well um, specified uh, story. So I'm really glad I'm learning a lot from this conversation. But okay, so then communism arrives and for many people in the west that's pretty much the end of the story maybe they would say well eventually china opens up and we're all mm -hmm. in and whatever and that um but i'm sure you're going to tell me that there are many more things happening right so mm -hmm. tell me about that right how much change is there during the communist era um what is it really that um uh transformational the period of uh Xiaoping, or, right like uh, mm -hmm. what what happens after communism gets to power and uh and its ideas become the core of of the well the political uh regime that's right. That's right. So um, um, actually, when Xi Jinping just came to power um, in the um, uh, early 2010s, so he once mentioned that um, the entire history of the People's Republic of China should be divided into two periods. The first is the first 30 years and the second, the second 30 years. So the first 30 years, that was the Maoist period. And you see kind of very, very strong state-led um, socialist uh, construction and uh, also a super destructive cultural revolution. Um, and in addition to that, also a periodic political campaigns that persecute people, but also kind of ensure that communism would be instilled to, Chinese, uh, to the Chinese mind. On the other, um, that's the second 30 years, that's a reform and opening, that's the period of Deng Xiaoping and later uh, Chinese leaders. It focus, uh, focuses on economic development and um, uh, people's material benefits. And uh, the Communist Party also pays lip service to building a so-called socialist democracy that is different from the radical democracy uh, in the Maoist period. Um, so that's kind of the, the um, uh, setup of contemporary debates about China. and. Uh, so um, the Cultural Revolution is a really landmark um, moment. And um, so maybe you can talk more uh, with Simon Law, the current uh, postdoc at Civics Initiative, um, because he's working on this time period. Um, but um, um, the entire Chinese intellectual history post 
uh, 1980s, that's my focus, um, is actually kind of a, to a certain degree is a reaction to cultural revolution because people would have different interpretations of cultural revolution. So some would say that the cultural revolution is just a continuation of ancient traditional Chinese imperial political system and ideology. So it's because Mao is still like kind of a modern incarnation of traditional Chinese emperor. So we have this cultural revolution because he's able to implement his, his crazy ideas without any institutional constraint. Whereas you can get another interpretation that is more radical, that is more modern, which argues that actually Mao has no precedence in Chinese history. He is a total kind of a maybe a creature in the, in, in the modern period. Um, and um, actually kind of uh, his ideas of people's democracy, of maybe mass political participation can still guide our normative vision for a future China. So, um, and then you, you have the third uh, school of thought that is Confucianism. Um, and they actually want to argue that, no, uh, the debate between the liberals and the communists, uh, between the liberals and the Maoists, actually um, um, is not suitable for China now. We are actually our way of national revival, and we want to develop a political ideology or a political theory that is more suitable to cultural nationalism rather than universe, so-called universal values of liberalism or universal uh, radical values of, um, of Mao or communism. And um, so Confucianism right now is on the rise. And um, uh, I would say that the study of Confucianism in the West is, is expanding. And also in China um, is just the kind of um, uh, liberalism right now is just around the margin. Whereas the study of socialist, Marxist ideas and communist ideas uh, and, and Confucian ideas they are the two biggest fields in Chinese in Chinese academia. Let's let's talk about that about maybe contemporary or recent um, circumstances, right? So I know you're working on a new book. It's mm -hmm. gonna be called probably, I guess, "Why China Needs Democracy: A Critique of China Model Theories." Right. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that. So tell me about what is this, what is the China model that you're making reference to mm -hmm. and why it doesn't work or those ideas don't work very well and why the answer to this is democracy, right? So what, 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 what do you have in mind thinking about uh, our need to have this, this book? That's right. So um, uh, I have to say that the China model is a very yield-defined term because you know that it means different things to different people. If you are a political economist, then maybe you'll hear about the China model as a model of political economy, as kind of a combination of um, a relatively free market with an authoritarian regime. And you study this model in an empirical way. And occasionally you would predict whether this coexistence would kind of um, um, would continue, would be sustainable, or it may collapse in the future. So um, uh, the China model that I study um, is actually normative visions of China's political future or normative visions of China's political reform, because um, after the after uh, 1989, uh, after kind of the Tiananmen uh, protest, actually mainland Chinese thinkers, um, they became more moderate because of censorship or because of some other reasons. So they believe that actually, um, uh, no matter whether you want to democratize China or maybe you want to make China a more efficient authoritarianism, you have to rely on, you have to count on the Communist Party. So the entire China model debate is actually kind of um, how to reform the Communist Party so that we can either become a better, um, so that we can either become a democracy in a, in, a, in a conventional sense or become, for example, a meritocracy that is radically different from Western ideas. 
um, they actually don't think that the current Communist Party is perfect. And sometimes they can go very, very critical about the party. But on the other hand, they still think that the Communist Party should be retained in the future political ideal, either for realistic reason that we cannot get rid of the party or for normative uh, moral reasons that a Communist Party can be more, for example, effective, can um, exercise more control of the society, can plan the economy and national development um, in a more kind of a maybe um, uh, in, in a less uh, chaotic manner, for example, like in the Western liberal democracy, that uh, when you want to build a highway, when you want to build a high-speed railroad in California, you debate for 20 years without doing anything, right? So uh, these are the advantages of a one-party regime. So they want to combine the one-party core with some kind of maybe um, selected features from the West. They want uh, more freedom of speech than currently allowed in China. They want, more, they, they want more freedom of association also than currently allowed in China. They want rule of law. They want constitutionalism. What they don't want is actually competitive elections, uh, especially kind of uh, voting to elect the highest leaders of China. So um, that's kind of what makes the China model debate interesting because that actually goes beyond some conventional and mainstream Western political theories. And what is more interesting is that they would selectively use some Western theories to make a case for China. And um, I would say that a lot of um, uh, legal scholars and the political theorists would find uh, would be surprised that actually uh, their ideas about Western uh, democracy, about Western liberal democracy, would sometimes be appropriated, be used by the Chinese scholars to say that, yes, we can have a one-party regime. So uh, the project is, is interesting both as an intellectual history, as a survey and analysis of those reform ideas, and on the other hand, I also developed my own justification for democracy, especially how you, how you should enter, how we should understand democracy, and how we have good and why we have good reasons to accept competitive elections as a core component of a future Chinese political ideal. Okay, but you cannot leave me like that. You need to tell me <laughs> briefly what's um, what are those arguments, right? What uh... And what's wrong about those ideas? What's the what what's the thing that you see at the core as a flaw of that China model? That's right. So uh, I I think the China model theory is actually they present some very interesting combinations of, for example, meritocracy and democracy, or one party rule and the democratic mechanisms. But for two reasons, I don't find their ideas kind of feasible or attractive in the Chinese context. The first is that uh, it relies on a very unreliable, realistic argument that the Chinese Communist Party has a willingness to implement meaningful political reform. That is a very common assumption among contemporary Chinese thinkers across different academic schools or ideological uh, standing points. So they actually, at least before the rise of Xi Jinping, they believed that the Communist Party had a very, very strong willingness to avoid a second Tiananmen protest. And they had a very strong incentive not to use violence and other coercive means to repress the Chinese people because they have a, legitimac a legitimacy deficit. They want to use democratic means to boost their legitimacy. So that's the first realistic assumption that I find very, very problematic because the past 10 years shows actually otherwise. And that shows that actually, if they want to maintain power, they have more mechanisms than democracy to ensure that they can stay longer. Whereas if they implement democratization 
even in an incremental manner, there would be some really unforeseeable uh, futures waiting for the Communist Party. They would they would worry that oh, this democratization, even though very limited, would be out of control. And if it is out of control, we would use more coercive means to kind of maintain our rule. So the risk is not kind of acceptable from the Communist Party's perspective. So that's partially the reason why they want to tighten authoritarian control by using those high-tech means developed in the recent years. So that's the first realistic argument I find empirically, um, empirically problematic. The second moral argument is that they all believe uh, we can have a virtuous party and we can rely on some accountability mechanisms that do not involve popular input and popular election. So they believe that actually you don't have to elect your leaders because the leaders, um, the, if they are selected through a meritocratic means and if they are controlled by upper levels of the political hierarchy, they can implement sound policies and they can be kind of, a, they can care about people's interests just as kind of maybe some neutral experts and benevolent benevolent officials. So I don't think this moral argument also holds because if empirically speaking, you see a lot of bad policies implemented by the party and also because of the democratic centralism as a central um, principle of the Leninist party, um, for most of the time, lower level officials would have to implement um, whatever decisions made by the upper level. So even though the over the lower level officials, they would have better ideas about how to make their people happier. So those ideas would be offset and sometimes, and I would say most of the time, would be overridden by the view of the superior. So if you want better government, then probably that's also a strong argument for democratizing the entire Chinese regime. So these are kind of the two arguments, the primary arguments. I mean, as I would emphasize in my book, if it's lucky to get published, these arguments are actually not innovative because these are based on our experiences and also hundreds of years of political science studies. So I don't claim any originality in these arguments, but I feel that there is still a need to develop those arguments in the Chinese context so that kind of we can um, maybe abandon or radically rethink some commonly received, some conventional wisdoms in the Chinese context. I think we need to schedule a new conversation to talk about the, the entire book once it's, it's out. But I would like to finish with... Um, one more question that will take us back to the broader view that you describe as becoming more popular in the field, right? This comparative uh, political theory approach, right? And you work on this, uh, you teach this type of um, ideas. You had a course at Stanford that was called Political Thought in Modern Asia Between East and West Asia. Mm -hmm. And and there you didn't talk just about China, but you brought in India, the Middle East, and and that sounds very challenging, right? So you're dealing there right. with you know, very short course as the ones we have in the quarter system at Stanford. Um, what's the approach that you manage there, right? And how do you deal with this? tension related to the fact that these traditions are probably very different, but mm -hmm. I guess that part of the exercise is identifying the features that are common among them, the reaction to, I guess, the Western ideas. What's the spirit of, of that course and how do you in general approach this uh, challenge of thinking globally about the evolution of ideas? without being simplistic about the particularities of, of different traditions. 
That's right. So um, uh, when I first proposed that course at Stanford, so um, I was like, uh, if I just offer a course on Chinese political thought, maybe that's too narrow and I may not be able to attract a lot of students. So I wanted to challenge myself and step into some fields that I'm not familiar with. But um, because this is teaching and because the format was actually a seminar, um, I don't have to claim any intellectual authority. I can say that I would be willing to learn with my students. So um, I actually got um, a very diverse pool of students. Um, so even though that was actually a pandemic year, I had to teach online, but actually every time the discussion was super interesting. So um, the, uh, the way that I organize the syllabus is actually uh, to divide that into two parts. So the first half of the, uh, of the quarter, and right now at Stanford, uh, at Fordham, I still teach this course. So the first half of the term, we actually um, um, study um, political thought in modern Asia through concepts. Um, the key concepts would involve the modern state, um, freedom, um, democracy, human rights, world order, gender equality and um, some and, and also racism. So um, um, these are the themes that I find super important in contemporary political life. So I want to ask my students to understand non-Western perspectives on those concepts rather than just the kind of uh, very straightforwardly introduce them, some key figures um, and uh, very influential books that they should read because um, they may not have enough ideas about the historical context of those of those political writings and that they may not have um, very good ideas about the challenges these societies have been facing so um, the second uh, half of the term because students i believe that after they have been well prepared um, about thinking normatively about those modern political concepts from both a western and non-western perspective I introduced some very exemplary political writings um, in each um, Asian society. And um, so definitely I told my students that I can only claim uh, authority in <laughs> Chinese political thought um, and for Japanese political thought, Islamic and Indian political thought. So these are just the kind of fields that I'm also learning with my students. Uh, but one thing that I want to emphasize is that I organize the course kind of um, to especially to want students to know uh, divergent interpretations of their tradition. So um, it's not just like, okay, Confucianism uh, is very conservative, Confucianism is incompatible with liberal democracy, or that Confucianism um, is a very good intellectual tradition. It promotes communitarianism. is actually kind of an, uh, is actually um, good um, medicine to solve the illness to 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 cure the illness of individualism. So these are just very simplified and polarized opinions about an Asian tradition. So what I want to show to students is that there can be multiple different possibilities of interpreting those um, non-Western traditions. And um, so uh, you have to be open-minded and you have to maybe um, think deeper than some maybe very simplistic and, um, and um, uh, stereotypical ideas about non-Western thought. So I find kind of um, students from both ideological positions uh, found my course helpful because at Stanford, I, I, I did have kind of most of students would be from the more liberal progressive um, standpoint, whereas I did have students from more conservative family background. And um, both of them appreciated this course because they offer multiple perspectives and they correct some of them, some of their kind of previous assumptions about Asian societies. So, um, but again, this is just a starting point. And I told my students that only use this course as an introduction, but um, learning is a lifelong process. I don't think that after graduating from college, that's the end of your learning. So um, it's just the kind of to give you a roadmap 
and how you can read further after after this course. I'm very glad that you finished with that um, statement and and recommendation, which is probably at the core of what we do at the at the Stanford Civics Initiative. So I'm I'm very That's glad right. that you brought that up, and I'm I'm very glad about this conversation. This was uh, very interesting um, and instructive. I learned a lot. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Javier. It's very nice talking to you. And we cover a lot of topics, actually. I know. We need to have another conversation. We That's should right. Into That's right. Pretty much all the topics that we cover deserve their own episodes. So That's but right. for the moment, this is, this is pretty nice. <laughs> Thank, okay. Thanks again, Damshang. Take care. Thank you for tuning in today to the Economic and Political History Podcast. Don't forget to stay connected with us on YouTube and Spotify. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at Javier Mejia C and connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me as Javier Mejia Cubillos. Until next time, stay engaged. Thank you and take care.